A young man with a feather in his hair steps out into the campus common in front of the student union building, a microphone held in his hand. The feather reminded us of old Geronimo movies, but Geronimo was Apache. This young man is Mohawk. Geronimo went down in history as a warrior, and whatever the truth may have been, his image was one of deadly attacks and war hoops. This young man spoke softly, almost as if unsure of himself as he brought a wampum bead, which he said carried a message of hope and trust from the Mohawk nation to the world. Another young Mohawk told those assembled, we want to have friends. Our hearts welcome you, just as our forefathers welcomed those who came from Europe and Africa in 1492. We have danced the twist, he said. Now you have the chance to dance as we do. We have come to dance, not as a Wild West show, for we are no longer animals in a cage, but a dance which reflects the seasons and the laughter and the tears of the Mohawk nation. And then, in a common where the SDS screamed anti-American slogans such a short time ago, 100 young people and some who were not so young danced the circle dance. The circle never ends, as life must never end, if the legends of the Mohawk are to be kept alive. They came, they said, to talk about peace and understanding for all people. Their message is one of truth, and purity and never-ending life. For, they say, that sun shines on all men of all tongues equally. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move, on the campus of the University of Texas at Arlington. The new signs are like the international traffic signs which have been used in Europe for years and are now being adopted by some U.S. cities. The signs being made and installed by the city's sign department consist of six types. They are the yield sign, which is similar to the old yellow sign, but with a red border. The do not enter sign, which is a red circle with a bar across it and the words do not enter. A sign warning of a traffic light ahead, which consists of a yellow diamond with a traffic light on it, and three prohibited turn signs. The no left turn sign is typical of the type. It shows an arrow turning to the left with a prohibitive bar across the turn. Others include the no U-turn sign, which is of the same type, and the no right turn sign, similar to the left turn, except that, of course, the arrow goes to the right. City officials say the new signs are more easily readable than older signs, which consisted of word instructions. More signs are planned for the future, but the city will wait until motorists get used to the first before installing more. One small problem, apparently the new signs aren't quite legal yet. Before they can be enforced, the city must pass a new traffic ordinance making them official, and apparently nothing has yet been done about that. Phil Reynolds, Channel 8 News, on the move. Well, I am personally convinced that there is a substantial traffic through the office of the Dallas Legal Services uh, that shouldn't be there. I think there are people that go through there that uh, could pay an attorney rather than rely on a, an attorney paid by your tax money and mine. And I think that this traffic needs to be stopped. Uh, I know of no way to stop it now that this opinion has been rendered. The latest figures were 1969, 
show that uh, our auditing procedures uh, recovered uh, for the state of Texas uh, $3.8 million that uh, we were entitled to. For the same period of time, the state of Illinois recovered $18 million and the state of California $30 million. So I think that there needs to be some major overhaul in the auditing procedures uh, that are presently uh, being used by the Comptroller's Office in the collection procedures and in the enforcement procedures. Uh, these are dollars that uh, the people of Texas are paying. You can bet that the merchant always collects that sales tax. The problem is that for one reason or another, the dollar does not get to the state treasury where it belongs. And this puts the, the reputable, honest businessman at a 5% competitive disadvantage automatically. And I think until we're convinced that we're collecting all the taxes that the state's entitled to, that you're already paying, that we shouldn't be talking about new taxes. Other than various keepsakes, some pleasant and exciting memories, the memorial behind me is the only physical remembrance of Captain Vernon Castle of the British Commonwealth Royal Flying Corps. Fifty-four years ago today, Castle died in a plane crash near Fort Worth while training Americans to fly during World War I. It was about a quarter of a mile from here at Benbrook Air Base, a base lost to time and progress since then. Now houses sit where flying jennies once roared by, and those who knew how to fly had taught themselves. But during World War I, a U.S. and British combined effort created several training schools. Three were near Fort Worth, and most of the instructors were British, such as Captain Castle. 
One man who served in the same aviation group with Castle still lives in Fort Worth. He is Richard Noon. Each year on February 15th, Noon organizes a party to pay tribute to Castle. Benbrook city officials and Carswell Air Force representatives join Noon today for our coffee and talk of old flying machines this morning. Then they proceeded to the Vernon Castle Monument for memorial services. Noon recalls the excitement of the World War I era through old yellowed newspapers and pictures and an old flying cap and a shoulder patch. He's 82 now and admits to some memory problems, but he does remember Captain Castle. Magnificent pilot, one of those really bright and some intellectual uh, intelligent uh, pioneer pilots, especially in, in aerial warfare. This is a type of plane that uh, uh, Captain Castle was killed in. Yes, absolutely. The war horse, the horse preparing to go into war. Uh, they were uh, not crude, they were mechanically and aeronautically perfect, of course, but they were work horses. Captain Castle was proclaimed a hero by saving the lives of two other men. His quick action avoided the mid-air collision, but cost him his life at the age of 33. Richard Moon has survived to jets roaring at supersonic speeds over the same spot where Castle crashed 54 years ago. The Air Force, celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, probably exceeds far beyond the wildest dream of Castle as he split the air at 70 miles an hour over Benbrook, Texas in 1918. What do you recall about Captain Castle? What do I recall? Well, my first impression is a brief, briefly said in that he was a, a brave man, a perfect gentleman under all circumstances. 